And a conversation now with real life Indiana Jones. We're going to talk to one of the persons that I'm much more interested in meeting, Sir David Heppelman Adams. He's a veteran adventurer, a mountaineering. He's actually uh, has climbed all the seven peaks in the world. He's an aviation expert and recently gone into sailing. Uh, please, let's uh, welcome um, Afwa Nasan Asama, this conversation with uh, Sir David um, Heppelman. So the first question is, what tangible changes due to climate change have you seen on your travels? Um, and I know you've been traveling for a while, so you've probably seen things- Are you saying I'm old? No, of course not. <laughs> but from your perspective, you've seen a lot. Um, so would you be able to tell us what you've seen um, as you've traveled and how that has changed so far? Well, I started as a, a young boy uh, at school doing the Duke of Edinburgh's Award when I was 13. And from there, I went down to the Bracken Beacons in uh, Wales. And from there, I went on to university. But at the same time, I did a lot of travel and climbing. And one of the first places... Uh, for me, big place for me was going out to the Alps. And since that time, you know, when I was uh, a young, young person, <laughs> um, I've seen massive difference with the mountains out in the Alps, which I used to climb all over. I used to go there for two months during the summer. And I've been going back in the last couple of years. And it's been extraordinary change. The glaciers have disappeared altogether. And I'm talking about miles of glaciers, huge volumes of ice. And also, uh, uh, I went to the Arctic Ocean back in the 80s, very, very early 80s, 83, something like that. So nearly 40 years ago. And it, at that time, it was much colder, minus, minus 55, minus 60. Uh, which we don't see anymore. Uh, and also there was a lot of pack ice, absolutely solid pack ice, all the way up to the continent of northern Canada. So you could start uh, from northern Canada, from the land, get onto the pack ice and just walk, ski to the North Pole. Um, and since that time, that short time, 40 years, there's one third uh, less pack ice. So I've seen uh, in these remote places, uh, the Alps not so remote, but I've seen phenomenal difference in the physicality of what's happened with climate change. Um, and, and taking that further, just a couple of years ago, uh, I sailed a boat, uh, a sailing yacht, around the Northeast Passage and around the Northwest Passage in one season. That would have been unbelievably unheard of uh, just okay. even 20 years ago. And, and a lot of people ask me, you know, global warming, climate change, and a lot of scientists and a lot of meteorologists will say there's no such thing. You know, the world goes into these cycles. You go from um, the ice age or mini ice age, and you do get these cycles. And unquestionably, you know, in the UK, we had vineyards. Uh, the Romans had vineyards. When they built Stonehenge, they were probably they had deck chairs when they were building it. So the climate does change, no, no question about that. We we know that, but it normally takes a couple thousand years. But what I'm seeing in my lifetime, in 40 years in my lifetime, I've seen massive change that would normally have taken thousands and thousands of years. And for me, that that's the thing that we've missed: the speed of change uh, that we're seeing around the world and what we're seeing in these high arctic areas we're seeing massive change very very quickly and that really is the canary in the coal mine for us in today's age and we are seeing the permafrost melting and all the problems that's going to cause um, massive reduction of the glaciers on greenland antarctica and that's going to cause problems so we've really got to look at this as a, a world and, and get our act together. So how have these changes affected the people that you've come across? What have they been saying about this? I mean, I guess what have they also been doing about this? 
Well, I, th I think you can split that down into different areas. Of course, up in the high Arctic, there's very few people. On Greenland, there's only 50,000 people in, an, in, a, in a massive area, but most of the people are along the coast. Uh, and so they, they have seen changes in their hunting. They've seen changing in the migration of animals, which uh, for some, that's their livelihood. Uh, even the fishing stocks, there's the changing of, uh, of the migration there. Um, and of course, these, as I said, these high areas, Russia, Canada, uh, in the States, um, there's, there's a very small uh, population. But if you look at, um, at the Himalayas, which is bordering China, and you've got India, you've got mass populations. And what you'll find and what we are finding is there's less and less water. And I think less and less water, you, you need water to survive. And I think that's that's going to cause a lot of uh, unrest. It's causing unrest already. Uh, there's there's migration of peoples already in some of these areas because of uh, less water. We're using more water for irrigation, but and and we're getting um, less water from the high mountains. So I think that's going to be a cause for action, and we're seeing uh, a lot of unrest because of that already. And that's only going to increase in years to come. Um, so can you tell us what COP26 is um, for those that do not know and what can it achieve? Well, um, COP26 is, you know, it's part of the United, United Nations and um, a group of uh, countries got together many years ago and said we have to reduce uh, carbon emissions and other things we're, we're dealing with the climate. And uh, they, they tried to set a protocol and thought, right, we've got to reduce it by a certain amount of time. And they agreed to uh, meet up every five years, see how these countries were doing. Um, and the problem with it is it, it, a lot of it is politics, of course. And the Americans uh, wanted, to, well, they did join and then they didn't join. Uh, so it is, it is uh, sometimes very, very political. But this year, I mean, it was cancelled last year, but it's going to be in Glasgow. Uh, so a lot of the nations around the world will be coming to the United Kingdom to discuss uh, those protocols. I think nice. the United Kingdom is way ahead of the game, or one of the countries way ahead of the game. But the problem we have is we might be great in this country, and we might be a little bubble in the world that we're okay, Jack. But the rest of the world's got to catch up as well because free economies uh, and business, we've got to open up the world. And that's exactly the same with climate. Uh, we, we're a small nation, but we're a rich nation. Uh, and a lot of our dirty industries, we've exported to other countries to do. So they're, they're creating the carbon that would have been in, in this country. So we've got, to, we've got to help these smaller countries. And that's why I think COP is so very useful and very it's absolutely critical that all the nations around the world buy in to this uh, and we've got to help each other. So the core message for today's event is no climate action, no peace. Um, what does this phrase mean to you and to the work that you have been doing? Climate, this is going to be the number one priority for all our nations, for the world, in a good number of years. We've got to get on top of this or we're all we're all doomed. So we really got to get on with this now. Um, and if we don't, uh, it's going to affect uh, the world and peace because uh, it's a finite resource that we've got. And uh, we've got a growing populations. They're going to be looking at uh, food resources, water resources, um, and that's going to lead to conflict, a big, big conflict. So the two, for me, absolutely are hand in hand. Um, so with that being the critical thing we have to address, what simple actions can individuals take to help co um, combat climate change in their own small ways? It's such a good question. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm often asked you know, by young people, well, what can we do? Because uh, what we do is not going to make 
any difference whatsoever. And some of the things that I've heard is, for example, even if we didn't, if we closed down the United Kingdom PLC for one year and we saved all the carbon for one year, that is only one day's emissions in China. So how, how can we in the UK affect the rest of the world? And how can one individual affect the rest of the world? And I think the way I see it is we've all got a role to play. So simple things such as, um, you know, turning the light switch off makes a big deal. If you've got the whole nation turning your light switch off or just, um, just looking at your garbage, looking at what you buy, apparently nearly a third, third of all everything that we buy we put in landfills. People, if they see an alternative and they see change and it affects them, people will buy into that. Thank you. Thank you so much.